Guys, if you'll turn to Titus, we're going to be back in Titus this morning, uh, kind of. The last time we were together in Titus, we finished up chapter 1. This morning, I'm going to give you an introduction to chapter 2 because I believe this chapter is that important to the life of the body here at Southside Bible Church. It's really why I chose to preach through this epistle was for what we are now going to study in chapter 2. And I think this idea of discipleship is somewhat confused or not fully understood in the church. And so I want to make sure that we are unified and like-minded when we hear that word of what Brian just talked about. So if the Great Commission is a call to make disciples, that is the very center of why the church exists and what we should be seeking to do then. We, we have got to understand this. This isn't something trivial. And, and so my simple task this morning is to talk about that. And so I think we need to, to start in prayer because we can. Last week we learned we've been reconciled to God. We can go right into the throne of grace and pray. Secondly, because we need Him. Thirdly, He alone is the only way we're ever going to understand this. He alone is the only one who can empower us to be that kind of a church. And this is our commission from the, the King of Kings. David Wells said this, It is very easy to build churches in which seekers congregate. It's very hard to build churches in which biblical faith is maturing into genuine discipleship. And so we can't accept anything else. But this is to be a local assembly where you get in and you grow as a genuine follower of Jesus Christ. Every member uses his or her gifts for the building up of the body of Christ. If you can come here and give yourself to this local assembly and not grow, we are failing the Lord who has given us our commission and our marching orders. I just can't accept coming and sitting here and not growing. That is defying the very thing that the king of the church has given to us to be as the bride of Christ. So now let's pray because we need to pray. Not because that's how we open up our service, but because we need our God. And let's all go join our hearts together and seek this king that he would do this very thing in our midst. Let's pray. Father, we do come before you and we acknowledge our weakness. God, the one thing this gospel has convinced me of is my weakness. And what I've learned in this gospel is a sufficiency of strength in Jesus Christ. I have learned of a vine that uh, is changing and transforming everything. And so, God, what I, I pray this morning, this is a life-changing understanding. This is something that we need to understand and we need to grow in as a body of Christ. And so, Lord, I'm praying that your spirit will do the exact work in every heart for every one of us are in a different place in our understanding and how we're outworking this. And so we look to you to do that work in every heart individually here this morning. God, I thank you that you're able to do that. And I pray that you will join us as one to advance the kingdom of God in making followers of Jesus Christ. Lord, we commit this time to you, and I pray it would be a time of worship. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, I want to start with Jesus' last words in light of his resurrection and his ascension. I read it last week, but I'd like to read it again for your hearing. In Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, Jesus came up and spoke to the disciples, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So here is the purpose of the church. I've shared this before. There's one main verb in that commission, and that main verb is to make disciples. There's three participles that modify that, but the one command to the church as Jesus leaves is you make disciples disciples. What is a disciple? Well, I'm going to boil it down as simple as I know how. Someone who follows Jesus Christ. To disciple someone is to help someone else follow after Jesus Christ. There it is, disciples. Disciples, followers of Jesus, that God would be glorified in His power as a saving God. And the means that we are to go about doing this is we need to go. We need to get out, and we, we leave this morning, and we go, and we go, and we, we meet people, and we love them, and we bring the gospel to them. We, we, we go. 
And then secondly, we baptize them. We bring them into the church. They come to faith. They are brought now into this beautiful, living, vital organism called the church. And in the church, we teach them to obey all that I commanded you, says Jesus. We teach you the Word of God, what He wants, what He requires. How do I walk and live as a child of God? And so there is a structure of our commission. And it's the structure is to make followers of Jesus Christ. It's a team effort. It's a family affair. We are all given to this commission. We're tugging on the same rope and in the same direction. And this is what the church has to be about, right? This is what it has to be about. This is what Jesus said it must be about. And we miss this again and again. And we get caught up in our programs and all the things we want to do. And we miss the Great Commission. One of the greatest hymns, harms, not hymns, one of the greatest harms that has come into the church is this me. It is just everything is about me. And the gospel is to break that. Evangelism has become your personal evangelism. And we just kind of leave you there. You get saved. Now you have your personal growth and you get your personal heaven. And all of those things are a part of the kingdom. But that is the, just a, a shallow focus. It's me. It's me. It's me. That's all you think about. You come in here, me, my growth. What's going to help me get to my heaven? And it goes no bigger. You've missed the big plan and the purpose of what you have been brought into as becoming a believer. You've been brought into God's redemptive plan for all of history. You're a very small piece in this big scheme of what God is doing. You matter to God. Yes, God loves you individually. But you are brought into the body of Jesus Christ. And you are a player in a very big drama called history, called his story that he's bringing about to bring the culmination where he'll be worshipped from every nation and the summing up of all things in Jesus Christ on that last day. We have got to rise out of the me. We've got to get out of that and come follow after Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and die and follow after me. If you want to be my disciple, you got to die to me and come live for me. Take up your cross, follow after me into this great commission. So we are called to die to self, to live to God. And to live to others. This is the purpose of the church. Going and baptizing and teaching all things to make disciples. And as Brian said, if teaching all things was just doctrine, then this would be easy. All, all we would need is classes and seminars and, and that would be it. And I'll tell you right now in Titus 2.1, we're going to see that that's a, that's a part of it. I'm not putting that down in any way. Uh, if you don't have that, we're going to fail miserably. But if, if you think that's the end goal, you have missed the Great Commission. Then Jesus did it wrong. <laughs> Jesus took 12 into his life and three even more intimate. And he taught them by words and deeds and everyday life. He corrected them. He rebuked them. He confronted them. He taught them about the kingdom of God. It was absolutely beautiful to read through the Gospels. He taught them how to walk in his footsteps which was to manifest the Father perfectly in life, devotion, and word. He gave himself to those men. If it was just teaching them classes and sermons, then we could do that easily. He would not have given all of the gifts and then he's given to the church, the gifts of encouraging and admonishing and mercies and wisdom and all that he has given that all, everyone in this room would cause the growth of the body. And so he's given us all of these gifts so that we will work together and be entwined in each other's lives and our different gifts can be used and that we would grow each other up into the head, the Lord Jesus Christ. So this church, it's a living, vital organism. It's not a building. It's a group who has been joined to Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit of God now dwells within us, empowering us to fulfill the Great Commission. So every member... The body causes the growth of the body. As you look at your own bodies, every little part works to cause us to grow up and mature and become men and women. So we work together to make followers of Jesus Christ. We are commanded by Jesus to do this. These are the very last words that he left to his church. And I'll just ask you this morning, are you doing it? 
Have you bought into a lie and you're running after all the wrong things? Are you doing this? Are you giving your life to this or is it just me? Is it just about me and that's all you do? Do you get the beauty of what God is doing? I was so blessed the other Sunday. I walked into church and Sunday school was already going and I walked by the youth group and I I just saw it packed with young men and women. And these kids were listening wide-eyed to Pastor Rutland teach. And I just saw all the helpers and they're, they're just pouring Jesus Christ into these kids. And then I peeked into the next Sunday school classroom with the fourth through sixth graders. My brother Steve and his wife were in there just laboring with these kids, and they were just big-eyed, learning the Word of God and taking it in. To so many of you who have given your time every Sunday to love and share the truth with these kids to help them grow up and mature in this faith and be saved. So there are just so many ways that we can serve to help make disciples of Jesus Christ. I could go on and on of all that there is how I give myself to this end and this calling of Christ. So part of growing in maturity is to help others mature. Christianity is followers who equip others to do the same. We learn and we grow and we pass it on. So what does this have to do with Titus? I forgot my water bottle. What what does this have to do with Titus, guys? Well, I'm glad you asked. It has a lot to do with Titus, more than I ever realized about a week ago. And so the church is God's design. Hear this. This is God's structure to bring about these discipleship relationships. It's absolutely brilliant, which should be no surprise to any of us that God is brilliant in how he's designed the church to bring about discipleship. So I want to start with kind of the big picture of Titus again, and I'll bring you into why I'm going here. The big picture was, you remember, false teachers were coming into the island of Crete and they were spreading their heresy. The culture was impacting the churches. Cretans are liars and gluttons and evil beasts. And so the church is now being affected by this culture. And so Paul is wanting the church to be the bright light for Jesus Christ on this island that is so necessary. He wants the world to see the beauty of those who come under the rule and the reign of Jesus Christ. It's, it's just like nothing else in the world. When the church is, is working rightly, there's such a beauty to it. It stands alone in all of its glory and beauty of what God is doing. And yet then there's our enemy, the Diabolos, who spends all of his days then seeking to destroy that picture and that unity and that beauty. If that's the key to how we make disciples, if you're the enemy of God, what are you going to do? You're going to do everything you can to disrupt the church, break it, mess with it, hurt it, all these different things. You are beautiful, young man. Who discipled you? Oh, he's, I, if you couldn't hear that, he said his mom. So that's, that's beautiful. So if it isn't attacked, we're just not doing it right. There's got to be a salt on this. And so what Paul is doing then is he's instructing Titus what to do for these churches in Crete. So just catch this. There's such beauty. First thing, appoint elders in every church. And he gives us this description of their character and who they are. And they're, they're to be imitated, Paul says. They're proven because they've discipled their wives and their children. And they have kindness and character within and without. What what we look for in this body as an elder, do you love the body? Are you going to give your life to the body for its growth and its edification? That That will be shown by sacrifice, giving for the good of this church and its growth. I want character that, that they, they understand the gospel and they're discipling and they're pouring it in to others. Do you see the, the beauty of the role then that the elders play? It's a crucial role. As the leaders go, so does the church. They are to be models of laying down their lives for the good of the growth of the body of Christ. If we're sitting in ivory towers just teaching high doctrine and we could care less about you, you're fired. That, that can't ever be it. So Paul's saying, I want elders who, who they show that they've already done this in their home and they're doing it in the body. They, they love the body of Christ and they're giving out their lives. I want that. There'll be models of it. And then secondly, Paul said, they've got to hold fast the faithful word. 
they got to teach sound doctrine. So we, we can't be moved away from the Word of God. In our day and age, they're wanting their ears tickled. They want something new every week. They're crying out for it. But what we need is the Word of God held forth and taught in its truth in season and out of season every week. How is anyone ever going to grow without the Word of God being taught and brought to them in truth? And so Jesus said to make disciples by teaching them everything that I commanded you. And so we need a pure Word of God being sown into the church constantly in our minds and in our hearts. We've got to give ourselves to it so that we might grow up into the head. That's discipleship. Follow after Jesus. I want to be matured up. I want to grow because I want to become like Jesus Christ. And God has designed the church to be a place where you can grow and become like Jesus Christ. That is the atmosphere that God has designed for his people to grow. Thirdly, then we learned that the elders are to be able to refute those who contradict sound doctrine. This was all chapter one. So if we are going to be a discipling church like Jesus commanded us to be, we can't let false teaching get a hold in our church. You, you, you let false teaching come in here and spread uh, those who come in under its influence will influence others as well, and it will spread like gangrene. And so we have to protect the church from false teaching to make disciples. You, you let false teaching get in here, and you will start hurting people in their walks, their lives. It's got to be protected for the good of the body of Christ. It, it's truth that makes followers of Jesus Christ. The enemy is always seeking to sow error because we, this, we see in Crete what happens when it spreads. That they weren't the light. That they, they weren't wild-eyed Christians following hard after Jesus Christ. They, they were becoming lazy and gluttons and all the things that were spreading. You let false teaching get in here and it will hurt this bright light that we're supposed to be. Fourthly, then, he said, the elders are to silence then those who teach falsely to try and correct them and guide them back into truth, and you reprove them. And if they won't listen, he says, then you reprove them severely. To remove them, then if they won't repent from the church. Is that to just be hard-nosed? No, it's to protect the purity of God's design for us to grow. The church is the perfect design to have an atmosphere to grow in Christ. Do you, you see the beauty of how it all works together in chapter 1? It's, just, it's a beautiful atmosphere to protect and set the environment for you to grow in Jesus Christ. Are you growing in Jesus Christ? God has given us the bride. This is perfect and beautiful, the design. We have elders with character that are walking with God and growing in their safe models for the church, along with a lot of other godly men and women in this church. They teach sound doctrine. They refute those who contradict. They silence those who teach falsely. And now you have a church that any soul that comes and joins it is in the atmosphere then to grow as disciples. You've been given everything to grow and prosper in your faith. And so that's the question to you this morning. Are you? If you're not growing in your faith, there's something wrong. God's whole design and structure is for you to grow and to be being conformed to the image of Christ. So you'll have trials where maybe you feel like you're declining or struggling, but as a, as, a, as a kind of a character picture of your life, are you growing in Christ because of the body of Christ? I don't, this is weird, but people go to church now and they don't expect to grow. What's happened? I just want good music that makes me happy. I just want sermons that cheer me up. People don't even ask anymore, how do I grow? How can I grow at your church? I just want to hear someone come here and say that. How can I grow? This is what God has designed the church to be. My whole life, uh, when I got saved, I was protected from false teachers so many times by these disciples. I had role models to look and to learn from. I had brothers and sisters in Christ to grow and learn from in this body. So many of you have poured into my life, and the body's causing the growth of the body. Jesus said then, baptize them. This is why the elders hear every testimony of someone who's baptized. Do they understand the gospel? Have they been saved? And, and so that our membership 
is with believers. Because the only way you're ever going to grow is locking shield with believers. And so we, we, the membership in God's church is regenerate. It's not like Israel where most of them were unregenerate. In the new covenant, every member who's come to Jesus Christ is regenerate. And so what we're trying to do as we assemble in a local church is that it's believers. And so it's believers who can build each other up and edify and grow each other. If 80% of the church is unbelievers, how can the body cause the growth of the body? That is what many mega churches have become. It's just become so easy to attend and never grow. And so you, just, you, don't, you can't fill the church with unbelievers. And if we're going to lock shields and the body causes the growth of the body with 80% unbelievers, how is that ever going to happen? That is the one reason, one of the reasons we practice church discipline. There's an accountability, as you just shared. If someone goes off into sin and discipleship relationships, we confront them and they repent and we grow and we help each other. But if you won't, if you won't repent, you're removed from the church in the following Matthew 18 with one witness to, to the whole church. Treat them as a Gentile and a tax collector if they won't repent. Don't let rebellious people against God and His Word dwell in your midst and just keep growing like gangrene in the church. He says you deal with it. And make sure then that those who assemble are not perfect, but they're seeking the one that is together. And they can pour into each other so that you can grow up into the head. Do you see why church discipline then is so necessary? It's not to be mean. It's to love people and lead them to repentance. But at the end goal, there is a way to keep the purity of the church. Because this is what God's designed for us to grow and to be built up. If you just let sin reign in your church, the discipling of each other falls apart. God's design of the church breaks down. I saw a church where the pastor fell into adultery. The church ignored it. They let him keep being the pastor. And you know what sin started characterizing the whole church? The sin of immorality and the whole church became defiled by it. And so we, we deal with sin for the good of, the, of the, the body, causing the growth of the body and the glory of God. Do you see the beauty of what God has designed the church for? Do you see the wisdom of Paul's counsel then to Titus? Get the church back in order, Titus, so that the things can happen that will grow the body up. Then the body can do what it's supposed to do, where it, the body will cause the growth of the body. Fix these things, Titus. And now we're going to move into chapter 2, where he's going to say, now fixing that, now go let it do what I've designed it. Get in each other's lives, older people, younger people, begin growing, discipling, building us up in the precious faith. In chapter 2, he's going to call older men to disciple the younger men and obeying all the things that Jesus has commanded. He's going to call older women to disciple younger women so that the Word of God may not be dishonored. The Word of God can be dishonored if the young ladies aren't growing and learning the godly things of how to be a godly wife and mother and woman. And if they don't learn these things, we're going to start making shipwreck of the name of God in this community. And so he's saying older women pour into them so the Word of God is not dishonored. And that's my burden with the, the, the parachurch today. Para means to come alongside of in the Greek. It doesn't mean instead of. It means come alongside of. But instead it becomes the church. There are times when it's necessary. I read this week of a ministry to naval men and women on a boat. There's no church. Hallelujah. They're getting in and discipling and pouring into their lives. But I'm telling you this morning, there is only one thing that God has promised that the gates of hell will not overcome. And that is His church. That is the bride of Christ the church is the design of God to birth new believers and to bring them into the body and for them to mature and to be taught how to be followers of Jesus Christ. The design of God is absolutely beautiful. And I praise Him for the church that He purchased with His own blood to bring this about. When a parachurch ministry does not work alongside the local church, their effectiveness will be greatly diminished. We just had the Fellowship of Christian Athletes at Denver University uh, open up to our college group to come and, and to preach and minister and be a part of it. And, and the lady who was running it said, we want to plug them into the church. We want to plug them into the body of Christ so that they will really grow to become followers of Christ. That's a gal who's getting it. 
is, is we can help evangelize these kids on the DU campus, but we got to plug them into the church if they're really going to grow. And so they're doing their job very well. So are you with me? Doesn't that just give life to Titus chapter 1 and 2? They're just so married, how these two work together perfectly. You can't have one without the other. It won't work. And so churches that just teach sound doctrine and refute those who contradict and do not disciple like Titus 2, they're failing their mandate from God. And churches that just focus on Titus 2 and not Titus 1, teaching the doctrine, will have weak members discipling others into heresy and a lack of truth, and it will propagate lukewarmness. These two must be married, or you will not get the fruit of what God has designed His church to be. So what God has joined together, doctrine, oversight, and discipleship, let no man put asunder. Doctrine and purity of truth and life with a discipling ministry. The elders are to equip the saints for the work of ministry. They're not to do it. They're to equip you to do what Brian just shared, to grow them up in the Word of God and discipleship so that they will disciple others and build one another up in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we must be a church that disciples one another or we fail in our great commission from the one that we love, the King of the church. Amen? I've been praying all week. I hope you see this. And I hope you don't just nod to this and walk away. I hope our lives are changed and we give ourselves 100% to this truth. What breaks my heart is that Christians can join a church and no one ever comes alongside of them. And what breaks my heart is how many times it happens right here in our midst, that you can come and, 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 and just be untouched. We're singles. I, I, I like the idea of singles living in families so we can model or at least get in our homes a lot more or we can model what it looks like to be, what healthy marriages look like, what it means to train kids. Uh, we, we have to have a, a church where there's no culture of sharing the gospel. Where we, you got to go. You got to go. You got to go. They got to get saved to be disciples. And so it just when, when, when the church loses evangelism, you, you're, you're messing it. You're missing that whole for one participle. Go. Get out there. Go meet them. Love them. Share Christ. Get them into Christ. Get them then into the church. When you have little hospitality in churches or you're not getting in each other's homes and loving one another and inviting them and just that should be a ministry of every person here. I just keep my home filled with the saints of God. When there's not men shepherding their wives where we take it seriously, men, I want to present my wife more holy than I got her on the day we got married. And you take this seriously, and I want her to grow into the image of Jesus Christ. No older women discipling the younger women just how to be godly and how to think and how to live righteously by all the wisdom that you learn by raising families and living in this world. Bring it into their lives. When there's no biblical counseling among members, we should be counseling each other on a daily basis of bringing God's Word and helping each other think through sin, life, how do I live? We just, we counsel each other. We admonish and teach one another. When there's little reaching out to people of a different color or social class, those walls should be so broken down that that'll never be an issue in the body of Christ. When there's no one to share your struggles with and get help, nothing breaks my heart more than if you're sitting here today with huge burdens and struggles and you walk in here and no one says a word to you and you walk out, I just hate that. We can't let that kind of stuff go on. we, we got to care and meet each other's burdens. And I, I, I like what Brian said, is you're going to have to be transparent. How you doing? You know, to really share my heart, I'd much rather talk to you about the doctrine of the Trinity. But to share with you, I didn't read my Bible all week and me and my wife are really struggling. It, it's going to take a lot to become those kind of relationships and those kind of people, but it's not going to happen by being an island all by yourself fighting this battle. So the people turn to the parachurch or they turn to something else, drugs, wherever it'll be, they turn. When the church is the natural environment that God has designed for discipling, this is where it's got to happen. And that is why the writer of Hebrews said this then. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. 
not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And so as the day gets evil and as it's drawing near, what's going to happen is a lot of people are going to quit assembling together. And I, I, since I've been a pastor, this culture is the worst I've ever seen with how committed they are to the body of Christ. If, if you make it one out of four weeks, you feel like you accomplished something. Discipleship and growing will never happen without what the writer is saying, don't forsake the assembling together. The body causes the growth of the body. You've got to be equipped for the work of service. You gather when God's people gather and you fight to grow and you get into each other's lives. It's going to become a habit. Of, you're probably not even here. I'm preaching to the choir. So if you hear this message later and you weren't here today, quit forsaking the assembling together. Okay, that's how you grow. And this is, this is how God designed it. He didn't design part-timers will ever grow in Jesus Christ. This church is perfectly designed by God for your growth, but you've got to give yourself to it. You've got to get in and open up your life and open up the Bible and get into each other's lives. Be consistent so that you can grow. And here is what I want you to hear. Some of you don't feel like you have any of this. You just feel like you're alone in a church every week. You don't know why. And then I got some of you who are blossoming in this, and it's beautiful to watch. You're growing up by pouring in to each other's lives, and I just got two extremes. And since I started ministry, I always have two extremes. Some people say, most unfriendly church I've ever met. I have never been in a friendlier church. My life is being changed. And you just sit there as a pastor going, what is the difference? How, how can they have such different experiences? Why do you think we got such a dichotomy in experience? Number one, it could be we're not a discipling church and we're unfriendly. And that's something I, I pray about and I, I pray is not true. Most likely, if that is the 100% case, there wouldn't be any of it then. So I, I think it's something we got to keep growing in, but I don't think that's your answer if you're on that outside. Second, the possibility that you're not really giving yourself to the body of Christ. It's, uh, we had a lady share in our group this morning that it's a little nerve-wracking when you do go to something and you know nobody, and she just stretched herself, opened up, and she's building those relationships and, and getting in. So it, it, is there a possibility that you've been hurt and you won't really open up? Is there a possibility you're just apathetic to the body of Christ? Third, maybe you're lazy. I meet a lot of those lazy. You just, it's, it's hard to give yourself to the things of God and meeting a, a midweek when you're tired. Maybe you're just uh, pulling a cane and you're giving God your leftovers. The, the honest truth is you're just giving God leftovers so you don't have a lot of fellowship because you're not giving God everything. Maybe just untaught. You're just following the culture of the church today. And all that is is you hear a sermon and you leave. And, and to, today what I've just preached is new to you. So what do you do with that? You're just, you've never heard this before. Then it's time to repent. It's time to repent and do what God's word says for the church. The other possibility is you're unsaved. Do you, do you know that light and darkness have nothing in common? And so you come and you say, I feel like an outsider. Um, that's not good. I've, I've visited churches all over this country, and I feel like an insider the first week I walk in. To feel like an outsider is not a good thing. There, there's a chance that you're not regenerate, that you haven't been saved to where just show me any believer who loves Jesus, and I'm there. They've got to look like me, think like me. They've got to be dinks. They've got to, you, know, you got your whole list of what they've got to be. Is that regenerate? When you've been born again, all I want is someone that has the Spirit of God. And so you need to maybe wrestle with is the, maybe the reason I don't fit in is because I don't fit in in the Trinity. And I haven't dealt with the real gospel of where I've been born again and I've been made alive to a love for the brethren. That's an issue that you at least have to pray over. And maybe it's just you're flat out selfish. I, I just don't have time for this relationship stuff. All I, it's me. All I care about is me and my own schedule and my pride and my uh, shyness and all of these different things. Guys, all these excuses, they're not going to measure up when that, that parable of talent says God has given you gifts for the body of Christ to grow it up. 
on the last day, he says, you're going to give an account. How did you use your gifts in the body of Christ? And when you say, you know, no one ever talked to me, God isn't going to say, man, that's a good excuse. What are you going to do with this? You're at a crossroad this morning. You have to answer this question humbly and honestly before God. This has got to be before you and God. What, what is the reason? Have you made this world more important than the body of Christ? Is, is pursuing your occupation taking up all your time and there's nothing left? These are hard questions. What do you think? This is God's design. This is how people get saved and how people grow. And every member ministry sacrificing of time and resources to help other people follow after Jesus Christ. To not do this is sin. It's disobedient to the great commission that Jesus has given to the church. Most people hear the great commission and they think, oh, that's, that's missions. I'm telling you, it's so much more than that. When I hear great commission, I think local church. I, th- I think local church to make disciples. And it's from the local church then that missionaries grow up and they're sent out. And you know what they do? They build churches. They build churches that do the same thing. And it's from the local church then where church plants go forth as as the young men are growing and being nurtured up and they learn this and they will go plant the same thing in another area. It's from the local church that we minister the gospel to the needs of a hurting community. The church is where the kingdom of God is grown and advanced. Are you giving yourself to it? Or is your Christianity just me? I'm praying for such a culture that makes disciples. That there's a teaching ministry, and then there's a ministry to every member. We share the gospel with those around us. Wake up, care about souls, get into soul work. And then we bear each other's burdens. Nobody suffers alone. And we give to God's work. And we give serious attention to His Word. Man, we give serious attention to learn the Word of God and to grow in it. And we learn how to walk with Jesus Christ and express it in day-to-day living by discipleship relationships. Teach me how to do this day-to-day and understand this great doctrine. How does it matter when my kid's rebelling as a teenager? How do I get there from here? To care and pray for the unity of those who have little in common apart from Jesus Christ. The one thing that brings this group together is Jesus Christ. We have everything in common in Him. And where everyone is pouring into someone to help them be a follower of Jesus Christ. You're discipling and you're being discipled. That's the picture that Jesus left for the church. And so I ask you, would you pray about discipling just one person? Would you seek to, su- for, to have someone disciple you? Discipling is building into generations after you're gone. And I love the, the parents who are pouring into their kids. And they're training them and teaching them and correcting them. And I mean, they have given their lives to that. You are building a, a heritage that's just going to keep moving and going. Are you giving yourself to the families that God has given to you. Mark Dever, a pastor out in D.C., uh, whose book I think I learned almost everything I'm sharing about right now, he brought this out and he said this in 2 Timothy 2.2, The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men. We have a whole ministry called Entrust. Entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And he brought out this idea, what is Paul getting after in that verse? Paul's after spiritual great-grandchildren. I've been coveting grandchildren lately. Every time a new baby's born, I'm I'm wishing it was mine. That's bad. (laughs) Paul poured into Timothy. So he, he gives his life, he's training up Timothy. And he says, Timothy, entrust these things that I've put into you to faithful men. Teach them. Pour into them, and we call them grandchildren. And he says, then they will be able to teach others also. What is that? Great-grandchildren. And you just keep seeing this beautiful process of what God does 
through discipleship. By discipling others, he, uh, Dever said, I leave time bombs of God's grace. I am leaving time bombs that are going to explode and go off all the time long after I'm dead. It's just here it is. I'm pouring in and they are going to keep just going off in different areas and in different people. When my son was in college, he had a Catholic roommate and they used to spend a lot of nights talking and discussing the gospel. And his roommate was uh, converted to Jesus Christ. And he went to, he was Hispanic. And he went to his family, and it was a large family, and like 70 of them started going to church from his evangelism. And I just look and say, okay, you know, playing football and going to school, you know how tired you are? And to sit up till 2 in the morning sharing the gospel with your roommate, you could say, why is someone spending all that time with him? And here's a time bomb now going off with 70 of his family members in church now worshiping Jesus Christ. I can't even tell you where that's going to go in the long run. I have uh, this morning a a gentleman told me uh, Pastor Kurtz is pouring into him. He's now pouring into this uh, ministry to kids on the street and skateboarding. And they're just boom, boom, time bombs going off. Great children everywhere. Get the vision of what this could be. It's bigger than me. I want time bombs of grace everywhere after I die. I always thought of that little farmer who one day comes in, the minister can't make it, he preaches the gospel, and Charles Spurgeon gets saved, and time bombs are still going off by Charles Spurgeon. I still read that guy today. Hundreds of years later, and these time bombs of grace are still going off from some uneducated farmer who shared the gospel with Charles Spurgeon. The life of the church is built on this principle of discipleship. This is God's way of influencing by truth and by life. Are you pouring in to others? We have provided all kinds of opportunities to make these relationships. The assembled church, I come to meet others, to love them, to see where they're at, to pray with them. I don't get here late and leave early. We get deliberate about the gathered church. We get deliberate about Sunday school, and we have community groups where you go and build relationships, and some of them might not be what you thought it would be. I'm not growing at first. You get in and dig in and lock shields and see what happens. Uh, Sal Garcia is teaching a men's group every other Sunday night. I saw two new ladies uh, groups that meet, I think, on Tuesday mornings. There are so many opportunities to get in. Anna has started a whole ladies' discipleship program. If you want that, there's fellowships. There's a prayer chain. I know your need. I'm going to come up to you on Sunday. I'm going to send you a card. Let's go for coffee. We are going to take advantage of these things. The only thing in the way would be excuses. And God doesn't give any of them in the Bible. And so what what is the reasons? And so there are so many opportunities to engage and to dig in to the body of Christ. But Brian hit it on the head, I think, is you got to be vulnerable. Number one, you you got to love. And I've preached so much from the pulpit. If you don't love, then you, you haven't been born again. And if you've been born again, we love because he first loved us. I love people. I love the body of Christ. Um, just let me be vulnerable. Let me take the time, invest, engage, give my life to what God has made the church to be. And when this is working right, all men will know we're his disciples. And they're going to start flooding in. And when they come in and see this, it's just overwhelming. It's the best apologetic there is. So I want to close out. I'm a little long-winded this morning. It's Brian's fault. It's, <laughs> it's not mine. <laughs> so I want to close out with just some practical things then and maybe helping us along in building this kind of culture here at Southside. So I got this from that book that I was reading by Dever. A couple thoughts, just some application. <coughs> Excuse me. Number one, initiate. This is not passive. <laughs> you are going to have to initiate it. I hope someone falls from the sky on my lap that I can disciple. You have to be plugged in. You've got to come early and stay late. Go to midweeks. Get into other opportunities. Initiate. There's nothing wrong with talking to someone and saying, hey, would you like to start meeting once a week over coffee and praying together? Sounds like you're going through a lot. Let's just let's become prayer partners together. There's just nothing wrong with that. It's very rarely when you announce to a bunch of people who do not know you at all and just say, I want to disciple you. It doesn't happen that way. It takes time and it takes investment 
And it takes sacrifice in this. There's no other way around it. Initiate. Secondly, do it outside the church and inside the church. You've got to have relationships outside the church for the evangelism to go to bring them in. And so get outside. If it's going to the same checker at King Supers and you just share with them every week, whatever it is, go. If, if something's within your heart, you just want to talk about it. Get out, talk, and then come inside. Inside to help each other grow and holiness. I want to be holy. Let's all help each other be holy. Thirdly, by teaching. And this is not just expository preaching. The list in Titus 2 for men and women is not that. It's the practical wisdom that you've gained by this doctrine, by a life of walking with Christ. I'm going to really tee off on the gift of older saints next week. And you go learn. It isn't someone that just they're brilliant theologians. It's that they have learned by doctrine and truth and a life of being ironed out. They have wisdom that is unbelievable that the younger people, I like what you said, don't just keep asking everybody your age, how do I do this? I've, heard, I've had young moms. I just like talking to the moms who have babies. How about the moms who had babies 30 years ago and they learned everything they needed? How, do you think their wisdom might be better than the one who just had a baby at the exact same age as you and you're learning all of it together? Use the wisdom of the church so that the gift of teaching does not exclude you. Did you hear that? Don't say, I don't have the gift of teaching. This is teaching by imparting your life and your wisdom and what you've learned and where you can help. Uh, that excuse is not going to work. I don't have the gift of teaching. I can't disciple. That is wrong. Do you have the gift of following after Jesus Christ? Then you have the gift of discipling. Fourthly, correct. Warn each other about choices. I like that. Uh, Matthew 18 goes on every day where we confront each other in sin. We teach truth and we correct their errors. Uh, Dever said, joining a church is like throwing paint on the invisible man. Your sins are now going to become visible. If you really get in and do this thing right, guess what? People are going to see them. And that's the, that's the beauty. That's how the church is supposed to work when we see and open up and do these things. Fifthly, model. Teach people to obey. The goal of discipling is to see lives changed. So we live out Christ before each other. This is a dying art of bringing people into your home, being around them. When I went to seminary, there was a man named Alex Montoya. He's planted almost 50 churches in the inner city of L.A. And he took me, and everywhere he'd go and preach, he'd put me in his car, and I would go, and I'd watch him. I'd see how he preached, how he talked to the people afterwards. He brought me into his church. He, I got to watch him shepherd what he did, what he said. I grew more from him than almost any other class I had. Get in each other's lives. Model. We communicate by our words and our whole lives. This has to be more than a classroom setting. I have no problem with classroom settings. That's chapter one. Chapter two, get into your homes and lives and each other's. Bring people in. You're such an isolated society. Mutual love, number six. Have peer-to-peer, -peer, love each other. I got to get moving. Humility. It's hard. They might not listen. They might not be consistent. Be humble with each other. Be one beggar pointing another beggar to bread. We mo model weakness. I'm really good at that. Too many say I'm not mature enough to disciple anyone. In our daily, come model our daily struggles and hardships, how we model to, to be forgiven and to restore our lives with God and to keep going in the faith. It doesn't demand that you're just the stalwart. It just, I, can, I can model to you how I deal with all my sins and my struggles. And my last point, and we'll, we'll pray, is guide them towards heaven. The church is designed that we help each other grow in Christ and follow him, and we follow him right up into glory. I, we we want to help each other get to that celestial city. So i got to close with Spurgeon because I love Spurgeon. Spurgeon compares himself to Mr. Greatheart in Pilgrim's Progress, in which Bunyan wrote. And he said this, he said, I to his church... I'm occupied in my small way as Mr. Greatheart was employed in Bunyan's day. I do not compare myself with that champion, but I am in the same line of business. I am engaged in personally conducted tours to heaven. It's my business as best I can to kill dragons and cut off giants' heads and lead on the timid and the trembling. I'm often afraid of losing some of the weaklings. I have the heartache from them, but by God's grace and your kind and generous help, and looking after one another, the church, I hope we shall all travel safely to the river's edge. 
Oh, how many I have had to part with there. I have stood on the brink and I have heard them singing in the midst of the stream. And I have almost seen the shining ones lead them up the hill and through the gates into the celestial city. Let's give ourselves to this ministry of locking shields. And I've, I've had the privilege, too, of watching some be escorted right into the presence of Jesus Christ. And I don't think there's anything sweeter than giving your life to somebody and shepherding them and helping them grow and watch them get their reward on that last second. So let's give our lives to each other and help each other get to that reward that we're all longing for and waiting for and hoping for. And so let's lose the temporal and get to the eternal. And let's be a, a, a church that's designed, that functions well to grow us up into the head the Lord Jesus Christ. So I have stepped on so many toes and I did it happily because I love you. I, I want you to get this for your own good, the good of the body of Christ, and to put on display to the world what this could look like and what it could be. So I'm going to let you get alone with God, get in your community groups, go deal with your hearts. Don't let e- excuses come easily this morning for why you're just an outsider in the body of Christ. It can't be that way. You're, you're sinning against God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the design of the church. Lord, my heart feels so much joy in your wisdom. You've designed it perfectly, and it is the one thing that works. It is your working. It is how you birth us and grow us and hold us and keep us maturing so that we might receive the prize, the crown, eternal life with the Lord Jesus Christ. God, I thank you for this. Uh, Let us repent for being isolated, closed, lazy, selfish, Uh, not wanting to open up our hearts. God, forgive us and let us begin to be deliberate and beginning to start to form these kind of relationships. God, I thank you for those who had the vision. May you fan it into a flame and may we love and help those who don't have this vision. God, let us be a church that helps each other journey in our understanding of discipling, making disciples. God, I thank you for this morning. Use it for the glory of your name and the good of Southside Bible Church. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen.